Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. It's Denise Salcedo and I am very excited to bring to you another interview. This week, my guest for today is none other than AEW's very own Sean Spears. What's up, Sean? Hello, how are you? I'm doing great. You know, it's so awesome to have you on. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for taking the time to have me on here. Uh, you look fired up, so uh, <laughs> as excited as I am. Let's exactly let's go ahead and get right into it man sure. aew has rocked the wrestling world and so with that being said what has your experience like been like with aew uh it's been uh it's been fast uh and, I, and let me explain so uh, like you said in that question we've kind of rocked the wrestling world we've kind of turned it upside down and it seems like even though aew is just over a year old it feels like we've been around longer. So it feels like we've kind of been, because we've been consistently putting on good shows, we've been consistently putting out good product with a lot of our top talent. So uh, the, 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 the way, the trend, the, the ascension of AEW is, is, is constant. And it feels not like a roller coaster ride, but it feels like the ascending. <laughs> Just we're constantly rolling up. We're constantly excited about where we're finally going to, you know, reach the climax and kind of come over the top of it. So things are exciting. Things are building. Uh, and from someone who's been around for almost 20 years, it's new and it's fresh and it's exciting. So that's probably the best way I can put it. I know that's not the greatest of all answers, but excitement is probably the best word to put it. Was it, you know, prior to signing with AEW and, you know, now that you've been there for a while, how has, is, has it been what you expected or did you like expect it to go this fast? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so coming into the doors, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, there was a, there's a lot of young executive vice presidents. Tony Khan himself is quite young. Um, but all of those guys have brilliant minds. So the concept, the idea of AEW when I first came in the door was, um, was big, was massive. They had great plans, but from someone who's been, who's been around for a long time and understands how the world of wrestling works, I have to see it to believe it personally. Yes. So I can hear everything all I want, but until I see things kind of come to fruition with my own eyes, I'm probably not going to buy it. Having said that, in my tenure here, I have seen things come to life. I have seen the plans unfold. I've been told, hey, this is kind of where we're going in three months from now. And truth be told, we've gone that way three months, you know, from that time to, to where they ended up. So coming in the door, I heard that talent was going to have creative freedom. I heard that they were pretty much going to have to put everything on their shoulders, whether it was going to succeed or fail. It was on the talent. And I was like, oh, okay, well, there's still going to be some restrictions and some guidelines. And there really isn't. So that is a beautiful thing for someone who's been around for 20 years and someone who's been around for two years just coming into the door of AEW. The ownership of your career is on you. So that is the biggest difference. And that is the, um, I guess that is the most exciting challenge with all elite wrestling is to week in and week out, come up with different content, come up with a different way to present yourself and present talent to the world and uh, hopefully get people involved and get people watching the product. And on AEW, you've had a lot of different character arcs, several of them. So how much input have you had and how important was it for you to continue to evolve? So I, that's that's interesting that you say. So you actually put the, I see a lot of people online say, oh, different, he's had like four or five different gimmicks. You said character arcs. Right. That's been the best description I've heard anybody call it. So well, <laughs> the reason being is because, you know, if I, uh, I'm trying to relate it as simply as possible to anybody that might be listening. So to you as a personality, I I'm pretty sure when you do your interviewing, um, you some of the things uh, in terms of how you do things professionally are different than when you do things personally. It doesn't mean it's a different character that you're portraying. It just means there's layers to your personality. So the same degree, if that makes any sense, that's the way I am in AEW. I'm just peeling back certain layers. Like, so one week I'll do the haha -ha, gambling at ringside with money in my hands with MJF. And then the next week I'm on Sean Spears News Network building a match for double or nothing. And then, you know, the next week I'm tailgating on the back of a golf cart. And then, you know, the next week I'll put on a glove and I'll start smashing people in the head with it. 
I'm just peeling back layers. I'm finding different sides of my personality. At the same time, I'm offering these to our audience to be accepted or not. But either way, I can gauge on where I need to go or where I want to go based on how they react. So that's the beautiful thing about having live television, about being uh, an artist in the world of pro wrestling. You're, you're offering out different things and hopefully they catch. They might not. But, you know, to be fair, that's how the Perfect Ten caught on. The second exactly. round, the audience, they took it and went massive. And I know firsthand experience, it only takes one little thing to catch on before the world follows suit. So uh, I enjoy the process of trying different things. A lot of that ownership is on me. A lot of the ideas and things that I've done have been uh, at my suggestion. Um, good, bad, or indifferent. But I'm always going to be the guy that swings for the fences. If I miss, cool, strike one, strike two, strike three. All right, never going to do that again. I'll do something else. I have no fear in swinging for the fences because sooner or later, I'm going to connect. That's really great. And speaking, you just said like it was the perfect segue. I'm going to connect. And here's the thing is that seeing your promo work, I, I, as a viewer, am connecting to what you're saying, you know, on the screen. And with that being said, I think that you have been showing some impressive promo work, impressive mic skills. What does it mean to you to finally be able to get that opportunity to go out there and, you know, put on these promos? Uh, so a lot of the video, thank you for one, for your very kind words. I appreciate it. But a lot of the, um, the video packages or especially with the glove and stuff, I shot those in my house. I Did you a, really? Yeah. I have a studio and a camera kind of little setup area, uh, in one of my rooms in the house. And I just kind of, all right, find the right lighting and get some people's ideas. And then a few of my buddies from AEW are editors. And I kind of just shot those in my house. Pen to paper, I kind of, oh, right, maybe I'll say this, maybe I'll say this, maybe I'll say this. Again, that goes back to the creative freedom that you're allotted. And, of course, nothing is going to see the light of television or, uh, you know, AEW Dark unless it is approved by Tony Khan. He is the boss of the bosses. So um, so for the fact that he's going to put that on AEW Dark or he's going to put a, a segment of it on AEW Dynamite is a testament to his trust in what I'm doing. So that just tells me all right, you're on the right track because this is good. Um, or just like you said, if some people are able to connect to a degree or at least understand what I'm talking about and what I'm trying to present and promote, I'm on the right track. I don't have to give everybody A, B, C, D, E. I can give them A, B and make them wait for C and make them think about D or E or where I'm possibly going. I believe in intrigue. If I'm watching a movie and I can figure out the ending in the first 10 minutes, then why do I need to sit through the next... 80 of it. What am I waiting for? Um, that I, is a perfect analogy. I believe in long-term storytelling. At the same time, if that movie doesn't catch me in 10 minutes, I'm out. So I have to try and find a way. That's the same way I look at my promos. I have to be able to engage an audience in the first few seconds, hopefully keep them through the middle, and then hopefully give them something to think about at the end. So thank you again for your kind words. But overall, uh, it feels very good now to at least try to communicate verbally. I didn't get to do that before. Uh, luckily, I was able to captivate an audience just with some showmanship and, you know, some really good matches. Uh, but now I'm, I'm trying to find a different way to do so, which is exciting as well. It's like that new level, the thing that you've been waiting for. What would you say, though, is the biggest game changer? Speaking of, you know, character development and promos and all of that, do you think it's the, uh, having the freedom or do you think it's more of having the trust or a little bit of both? It is a little bit of both. Um, I think in my time in AEW, uh, I haven't been put in a very prominent position. Uh, I came in very uh, high profile against you know, Cody, which, you know, anybody in that spot is going to be a high profile when you're facing a guy like that. Uh, but that was at a time when there was no AEW Dynamite yet. And that received a lot of attention. Um, since then, I think I've shown a lot of versatility. I think, uh, you know, a lot of layers to my characters we kind of talked about a little earlier. And I've proven that whether anybody wants to admit it or not, and this is going to sound cocky or however you want to take it, um, I've proven that I am pound for pound the most well-rounded performer AEW has. And I, I will put myself up against anybody on that roster in terms of being able to adapt to any situation on any given night in any given moment. And that just comes from nearly 20 years of experience and paying attention to all the guys that I've tried to emulate throughout my career. Um, 
I also feel, uh, to your second part of that question, that I've earned trust because I believe in doing the right thing. I believe in professionalism. I believe in putting on the best possible match, regardless of the scenario, for our audience. So, uh, again, that is a that is something I will always swing for the fences on. And whether I miss or not, either way, the audience is in mind. That's the end goal. If I can engage them in any way, shape, or form, good, bad, or indifferent, I've done my job on the entertainment room. Well, with that being said, I remember when you first signed with AEW, uh, in an interview, Cody said in regards to you that you were a great a great hand, great for the young guys, and a potential coach. However, you know, you're mentioning that you're a very well-rounded guy. You've been tearing it up. So how does that motivate you, uh, you know, seeing a young and hungry locker room? How does that sort of, you know, make you not want to necessarily fall behind all of these guys that are ready to grab that spot? Well, being called a good hand, you'll find conflicting descriptions on it. Uh, in Cody's, in Cody's case, it, it, you know, it got him crowned with a steel chair. Uh, being called a kiss, uh, a good hand is a kiss of death, essentially. It means that you're good at what you do, and it'll probably keep you around for X amount of years, make an X amount of dollars. But it also could mean there's a glass ceiling. That exactly. You're not going to get past a certain point. That's the way I took it. So coming from a guy who brought me into AEW, coming from a guy who was saying my praises for all those years, I didn't take that too well, and we saw what happened. Uh, in terms of the coaching aspect and things like that, I've always been someone that prides uh, themselves on helping young talent. I have a school in Apopka, Florida, um, you know, for that exact reason. I, I believe in giving back to the industry of professional wrestling that has given me a great deal in my life. Having said that, I'm not ready to be a coach yet on a, you know, in AEW. WWE asked me to be a coach three times before I left. I took that as a kind of a backhanded stab at my in-ring ability, meaning, you know, you're probably as good as you're going to be. You're probably past your peak. Maybe we should transition into some coaching. I don't feel that way. I feel I still have a great deal to give. I still have, a, I feel I have a lot to accomplish still. I really haven't hit many of the goals that I've set for myself. The good news is, is that when I tell you I'm 20 years into this industry, and goes, oh, God, he's, he's getting old. No, <laughs> it depends. I also haven't been in the main event scene, so I haven't had to break my body for 20 or 30 minutes every night for five, six, seven, ten 10 years on a consistent basis. I probably still have easily another five years, six, seven years, of in-ring ability if I choose to, with ease because I feel fantastic. So there's a flip side to everything. Um, and I can go on and on about that, and I don't want to get long-winded. But uh, in order to stay ahead of the young talent, you have to pay attention. You have to see what young talent's doing. And I see what a lot of young talent are doing. A lot of young talent are taking a lot of risk, a lot of high risk, hoping for high reward. Um, with that, comes a great deal of, I guess, danger, risk. Um, again, I'm pretty sure if you ask them, they're going to tell you that the audience is what's in mind. They want to put on the best possible performance they can. Me, I sit back and I look at a guy like Darby Allen, who has all the talent in the world. I look at a guy like Jungle Boy, all the talent in the world. And I sit there and I go, okay, well, those guys can do a lot of incredible things, but sooner or later, you know, all it takes is one miscalculation all it takes is one misstep mistimed little small little footing thing and you're gonna crash and burn and when they do i'll be there standing over top going hold you <laughs> and here's the thing though is that you mentioned you mentioned this earlier that you said that when sort of someone puts that cap ceiling on you it can be like oh like this is all that you see for me you know and i have this potential in myself i believe that i can do a whole lot more and i think that some of the most successful wrestlers that we've seen in wrestling are those guys that were told no 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 or this is not you know what you're doing is not working but when you start letting that person be who they want to be or you let them have that invention of themselves you sort of see that you know they end up becoming somebody like that much larger and so that was one of the things that you just reminded me of right now and it's like even with cody rhodes you know he was given this certain ceiling and then you know he went off and did his own thing and now you know he's where he is at now so i do think that that is something that in turn can be a positive 
I think that that can be said about anybody in any walk of life. Yes. Um, regardless of your field that you're in, you know, the more you aim to accomplish or the harder you push, the more people on the outside looking in are going to go, no, no, no. Like, you know, you're good or just stay there or just, you know, you make good money, you know, just kind of deal with the, with the, with the crap for now. You make a good living. No, I, I am a, 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 a proud, proud protester for happiness. I, I believe happiness trumps everything. I, I've met people that make $40,000 a year and are happy as can be. And I know people that make over a million dollars a year and are miserable. Uh, you can have all the money in the world, but if you're not happy, nothing else around you is going to work. So um, here in AEW, I am beyond happy. At the same time, I've been very lucky to make a very good living and I've provided for my family and I've, I'm, I'm close to being set. I'm, I'm good. So now I get to focus on the wrestling side of things. And that's just, it, go, it just goes back to, like you said, believing in yourself. At the end of the day, when you're 70 years old or whatever, and you look back, um, how are you going to remember your time? Whether it be interviewing or, you know, acting or singing or, you know, working in a clothing store. It doesn't matter what it is you're doing. You want to look back and remember those times saying, hey, I kind of did things on my own accord. I pushed as hard as I possibly could for the things that I wanted that made me happy in my life, that made the people around me that I care about the most happy as well. Uh, I don't want to live with regret. At my age now, knowing I've probably lived two lifetimes, and I mean that in the sense that I've done a great deal in a very short amount of time, I feel, compared to many other people in the world. I feel very fortunate to have done that. The one thing that has taught me is when you're 70 years old or 75, do not live with regret, whatever you do. So I keep that at the forefront. And hopefully if someone's listening to this right now, hopefully hopefully they can too. Exactly. I think that's a really good mentality or state of mind to live with. Now, one of the things that I do want to talk about is Tully Blanchard, because I also think that he has added so much to your character. What has it been like working with him and how did the relationship sort of come about? The, uh, I mean, the easiest example, I get to ask that a lot. What's it like to work with Tully Blanchard? You, you, you said it earlier. He's added so much, and he's the kind of guy with his legacy, Hall of Famer, everything that he has to offer. In a, he only had a 13-year career. I don't know if you knew that. A 13-year in-ring career. That's it. But his legacy has carried him well over 30. So it's yeah. a testament to what he and the Horsemen were able to do in a very short amount of time that has lasted throughout years and years and decades of professional wrestling. He's going to enhance anybody that he associates himself with. Uh, it's just, and I think that was um, that was the idea when we were being put together. He was going to elevate me uh, in the eyes of the audience, which he has. Um, obviously, starting off kind of in a hole, facing Cody. Uh, again, a week or two later, facing John Moxley. Uh, you know, we kind of dug ourselves a little bit of a hole. Uh, that was pretty hard to climb out for a while. I think only until recently, we've actually started to find our, our footing and things have really started to come together. Uh, there was a time frame there when he was gone for about two months. That was when I was kind of being silly, goofy. I wasn't, you know, I was gambling by ringside. I wasn't taking things too seriously. I kind of lost focus and that kind of culminated with, you know, the double or nothing showing whatever match you want to call it with uh, Dustin Rose there. Um, until he had enough, and he kind of got me refocused. And that's what he's great at. He's great at having his talent, the guys he looks out for, refocus when it's time to refocus. Um, his mind is second to none. Uh, and I'm learning things on a consistent, daily basis with him. So uh, we have plans, we have ideas, but I can't tell you those right now. No spoilers. No spoilers. No spoilers. Okay, so then, so because I was going to ask, Obviously, with, with Tully aligning himself with FTR, the fans right away went in this direction where they want, you know, a four horsemen type of group with yourself included. Is that something that you would want or something that you think should be left in the past? I don't think that there is any duplicating the four horsemen. Uh, there have been some great uh, factions throughout history. We are talking about arguably uh, the greatest when we talk about the four horsemen. Impossible to duplicate. I don't care what players you try and put into it nowadays. Um, in terms of FTR, uh, I know those guys for a very long time. They came in the door of AEW. They've, they've been, they're arguably the greatest tag team in the world. 
beyond accomplished, you know their, you know, their resume fairly well. Uh, but when they came in the door and they said, we want to be the AEW World Tag Team Champions, there is nobody to go under the wing of better than Tully Blanchard. He's done it all. And as long as I've known Dax and Cash, they have been a splitting image of Arn and Tully through their whole career. So now they work with him. I, I see them talking all the time. We all have the same concepts. We believe what is old is new. We believe the basic fundamentals of professional wrestling still work to this day. We believe in telling stories. We believe in selling. <laughs> we believe <laughs> in doing things much more differently than the rest of the AEW roster does. That's what we all bring to the table, and that's what Tully loves about managing me and managing FTR. Whether you'll see us all together at some point or another, I don't know. Tully's business is Tully's business. Uh, when he goes, I don't talk about FTR business, and when it comes to FTR, he doesn't talk about my business. So uh, right now, I think he's kind of taking certain guys under his wing that he believes in, and I think you're just seeing the beginning of things. Wonderful. And speaking of bringing something new to the table, I have to ask one of the most heaviest topics talked about in wrestling right now is the Wednesday Night War. As someone with a with his wife on the other side and many other friends, uh, what has the experience been like for you? So uh, I got asked this last week, too. Uh, I could care less about ratings. I am, I, it's not in my job description to care about ratings. I don't get paid to care about ratings. Uh, that is a tens of millions of dollar deal and conversation between executive vice presidents and owners and network you know, executives. So my job is to go out to the ring and bell to bell, put on the best possible performance I can with a guy that I'm working with. So uh, I've, I've never cared about numbers. Um, I've also worked in NXT. And even in that time, I didn't care about numbers. Um, in terms of my wife, uh, she obviously is a Monday nighter, um, doing very well. It's, it's not as, uh, I, I watch her, I watch when she's on and, you know, kind of give her feedback if she asks for it and she'll watch when I'm on Tuesday nights and she'll kind of give me feedback or what she thought was good and bad. And that's the extent of our, our wrestling conversation, but we love that about each other and we love watching each other perform and we like, you know, kind of going back and forth about different concepts or ideas. Um, you'll hear everybody talk about the Wednesday Night, Wednesday Night Wars and some talent in AEW will, you know, call themselves a demo god and all this, <laughs> kind, of, all this kind of jazz. Look, knock yourself out, sell t-shirts, do whatever you have to do. At the end of the day, I don't care. All I care about is the fact that 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 million people are talking about professional wrestling on Wednesday nights. That is all I care about. And Wonderful. If you put me over at the same time, put me over. <laughs> Wonderful. And now, before we get into our final portion of the interview, I do have one more question for you. Uh, what, are your, what are some of your goals that you have within AEW? I got to get that TNT championship. That, that title is tailor made for a guy like me. Um, yeah. That, 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 when, once that was introduced, that was that, that kind of. We were on a trajectory to kind of follow a certain path, but then once that kind of came to life officially, uh, Tully and I kind of transitioned our focus, and that is our ultimate goal, is to be the TNT champion at some point or another. Um, but we're very long-term planners. We're in no rush. Uh, we'll pick our spot, and when we do, we'll execute it. Wonderful. All right, so now before we wrap our interview, we're going to move on to the next portion, which is our lightning round game. And basically, I'm going to ask you 10 random questions about yourself. You can answer them as fast as you, as fast well, as you well, want, however you want to answer them. I, I get hit in the head a lot for a living, so if they're a little, not as fast, they're a little slow, then just bear with me. That is perfectly fine with me. Answer them however you want to answer them. But here we go. Are you guys ready for lightning round with Sean Spears? Question number one. If your life could be set in any video game, which one would it be? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say because I've been playing it lately, and it, it's going to sound a little morbid but to a degree, but Last of Us. Oh, I was one of the last survivors. And I'll, I'll explain to you why. Do you have time for me to explain why? Go for it. Go for it. You know how, like, I, I, I've done this, but like many people in life, they, you know, 
I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know what path to go down. I don't know if I should go to school. I don't know if I should take this job. I don't know if I should move over here. There's so many options where people become overwhelmed and they kind of like, you know, they kind of crumble up inside. And that could be very debilitating. I have, I've had moments like that in my life. Oh, am I doing the right thing? You know, da, 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 da. All right. Now, for The Last of Us, that is a setting where, again, there's been like a breakout apocalypse and most people have died, but very few people have survived. And now they have to you know, do their best to survive in a world that's trying to destroy them. You don't have many options anymore. Your job is to survive. Your job is to hunt. Your job is to get supplies and survive. It's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. You don't have to try and go in a million different directions. You just have to try and survive. So, and it would be very, very challenging. I think I'd be pretty good at it. I don't know why, but that feels very, very relatable to our real world circumstances right now. <laughs> survive. <laughs> um, question number two, what is your favorite Canadian food item that you wish was here in the U.S. as well? Oh, uh, there is a place that I haven't, I haven't seen it in the U.S. called the Mandarin. Oh, okay. Yeah, Mandarin. never heard of it. Asian inspired. It's a huge buffet, but it is, oh, it's got everything you could possibly imagine. I go there with my grandmother. Every time I go home, that's our deal. That's our date night. We go, I pick her up. We go to the Mandarin. She Puts me under the table every single time with plates and plates of food. I don't know where she puts it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I've only seen one in St. Catharines, Ontario, where I'm born and raised, and one in the Toronto area. I've yet to see one filtered into the States. But if they can bring, if I can bring one thing over there from here, it would be that and probably some horns. Awesome. Question number three. When picking a movie to watch for date night, who normally has the final say? Is it you or is it Peyton? Oh, it's, it's the wife. <laughs> it's the final say. A lot of the movies I choose she has never seen before so every now and then she'll let me introduce her to a new movie that i'm blown away at the fact that she hasn't seen but for the most time when it's date night you know it, it's it's a lady's choice i'm a big fan of ladies choice wonderful question number four what do you think your dogs think about you they think i'm a moron no <laughs> no doubt about it i chase them around the house they chase me around the house i talk to them in voices that I assume if they could speak, they would talk to me in. Um, so they probably just look at me half the time like, this guy's, all right, well, at least we have her. That, that, <laughs> that's the way I kind of see it. But uh, I mean, they're the, they're the sweetest. So hopefully they think I'm the same, but who knows. So what you're saying is that you're not the favorite. <laughs> Definitely not. Mama's the favorite. <laughs> Question number five. What was the video game that got you into gaming? Uh, probably NHL. I have always been a huge fan of hockey. I played hockey for like 10 or 11 years growing up. So that when I first got the Sega Genesis or even Nintendo Blades of Steel, that was my go-to when I was a kid. And even to this day, now with the PlayStation and all that kind of stuff, I still play NHL. So definitely hockey. And that leads us into our sixth question. Who do you have winning the Stanley Cup? Oh, my Canucks are still in it. So my Canucks. I haven't watched too much lately, but let's go, boys. Come on. <laughs> Question number seven. We all have that one thing that bugs our spouses. What do you think bugs your wife the most? About me? About you, yes. Um, I, have a, I, I think some things, uh, I have a tendency to, I think I have a tendency to kind of blow up about certain things real quick that don't matter, but I'm also very dismissive about things that really don't matter. So I think that uh, contradiction can kind of throw her off and go, hold on, you just got mad about that. I was like, yeah, but it, it doesn't really matter, does it? I'll go, no. And then two minutes later, she'll be mad about something. I'll go, yeah, but what can you really do about it? I'll go, let it go. It's okay. It's always easy to tell the other person to let it go, right? <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm a walking contradiction sometimes. <laughs> Question number eight. What is your favorite and least favorite movie genre? Um, least favorite? Uh, I'm a sci-fi. I'm not a big sci-fi movie guy. Um, I'm a big fan of thrillers. Oh, nice. Long-term, suspenseful, got to put the pieces together. Oh, I didn't see that coming. Those kind of movies. Like the psychological ones? Yes. I, yeah. I love those kind of, you know, if I had to throw back like Silence of the Lambs, I love those kind of psychological thrillers. So those are my go-tos. Wonderful. Question number nine. Who would you say is the funniest person backstage at AEW? I don't know. I have some good laughs with, with you know, Brody Lee. We, we get along really good. Me and Billy Gunn laugh a lot. Uh, Cody's always 
keeping things upbeat and yelling random things backstage that make people laugh. Uh, it's just such an overall a really good atmosphere. If you walk through the crowd at AEW, like in, in the certain back backstage area while TV's going on, you'll be hard to find someone who isn't laughing at some point. There's usually a group of people laughing, enjoying themselves, or some. It, it's just a very uplifting atmosphere. So, uh, but if I had to pinpoint, I, I get along really well with uh, with those guys the most. Awesome. And last question, question number 10. How many donuts can you eat in one sitting? Oh, baby. <laughs> so, oh, she's going to kill me for this. I'll try again. So, she, she probably won't watch this. I used to at least won't show it to her. Um, so, my wife um, set the gauntlet record. She was in Canada once. She's a massive fan of Tim Hortons. I think over the course of four days, she had 24 donuts. No. Which is... And she, if you've seen her, she looks like... I, I can't know. see it as a possibility. That's six a day. Six oh. a day. So I, I was blown. She told me that over the phone. And I, I think I, I made the face I'm making right now. I was almost thinking, like, I don't know if I could do that. I think I can probably... In a day, I can, pro I can probably do six before I start feeling like, oof. But six a day for four days, I couldn't do it. Oh uh, man! That, old records, uh, twenty-four and four days. Uh, she's she's a badass. So that, I'm probably half a dozen, half a dozen max before I start getting sugar coma and I'm done. Exactly. Well, you know, I honestly wish that, you know, we could sit here and eat all the donuts in the world without having to worry about calories or just feeling, you know, bloated thank afterwards. <laughs> um, Sean, I want to thank you so much for doing this interview with me. It has been an absolute blast chatting with you. Before we go, where can people find you on social media? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at perfection with a 10 instead of the IO. And on Instagram, I'm at the Sean Spears. But most importantly, you can catch us AW September 5th, all out. Ooh, not going to want to miss that. You're not going to want to miss that. Um, all righty, everyone. Do not forget to give this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll have all the links in the description box below so you guys can follow Sean Spears. Do not miss all out. Again, I will have the links for that as well. Other than that, we'll see you guys later. Bye, everyone.